This is the concept for today's project, which is a fantasy floating island style light. This is going to be made up of a crystal tower that's slightly translucent so we can have two sets of individually addressable RGB LEDs underneath so that we can light it up in different colours. It's also going to be on a floating island. It's not actually going to be floating but hopefully we can achieve that kind of look. And this is going to be made out of cement. There's going to be lots of different techniques used in this video so it should be very interesting. So sit back and enjoy. So the first thing we'll need for this project is a good looking piece of wood for the backdrop, which will later support the floating island. I've chosen walnut as it has a nice grain texture and colour. To make it a bit more interesting than just a plain old rectangle though, we can spice it up by tracing a random jagged line on top. I did this with the help of tissue paper for some true randomness. This can then be cut out using a coping saw and then given a few coats of finishing oil to give it a deeper, more vivid finish. As you can see, the final result is much more interesting and resembles a distant mountain range. Now we can start working on the electronics for it. First we'll drill two holes relatively far apart on the back, but only part way through the wood so that they don't go through to the front. Next we need to get some sticky back copper tape, links to which you can find in the description by the way, and add two strips of it on top of these holes. These will serve as power lanes for the three LED controllers we need for this project. These things are very small and inexpensive, and are designed to be hooked up to colour changing RGB LED strips. Literally any colour you like can be generated with these, thanks to the tuning provided by the remote control. The first thing to do with them is remove their outer covers to reveal the circuitry on the inside. The four output pins on top can now be removed with a soldering iron, as can the infrared receiver on the bottom. It's worth taking a photo of its wire colours first though, as the receiver will need to be reattached later. Lastly, the power connectors can be chopped off and then the white covering removed, leaving us with just the red and black power wires. The controllers can then be glued to the back of the wood, with the red wires all on one side and the black wires on the other. They can all then be trimmed and soldered to the copper tape. Now one of the infrared receivers can be reattached to any one of the controllers, using the image taken earlier for reference so you can get the wires connected in the correct places. The leftmost wire can be left loose however, and this is because it's the signal wire and we'll be making a separate set of switches to redirect its signal to any one of the controllers as desired. To make these switches we'll be going full on DIY, and the first thing we'll need is a strip of thin aluminium. As you can see it's quite bendy, which is ideal. Using a knife we can simply score some lines across it and then bend it repeatedly to break it into three separate pieces. These pieces will later be mounted to the wood to form the switches, so they also need some mounting holes through which they can be clamped in place using screws. We need to drill some pilot holes in the wood for these screws, again only going part way in. Before mounting the aluminium tabs in place however, we can drill another three holes near the edge, which this time can be joined together with a strip of copper tape and capped off with three small screws. These small screws will form electrical contact points for the infrared receiver's signal wire that can at this point be soldered to the copper tape. To complete the circuit, we can solder a short length of wire to each of the signal receiver pads on the LED controller boards, which are of course the ones on the left. These wires can then be routed to each of the three remaining holes and can be clamped in place by screwing the aluminium tabs down on top. These need to have a slight bend in them first though, so that they hold themselves off the outer screws. When pressed, the aluminium tabs make contact with these screws and complete the circuit, carrying the infrared signal to the control boards individually. Although it's simple, it's pretty cool, and looks quite interesting visually as well. Now it's time to add the first set of RGB LEDs. As we don't need a particularly long length of them, we can cut off some short lengths and stick them to the back of the wood, not forgetting to bridge them together using some short wire. 
They now need to be hooked up to one of the controller boards. To do this neatly, I'm going to use some wire from an old IDE computer cable, because it's in a bonded flat form. This means that it's possible to peel off a set of four wires to make a really neat connection with the output of one of the controller boards, which is the bit that had the pins removed from earlier. As the LED strips have a particular order for being wired up, which is shown on screen here, make sure that they get hooked up to the controller board in the correct way using this diagram. With that done, we now need to make a mounting system for the whole thing to later be hung on the wall with. A novel way of doing this is by using two copper pipe T-joints. To prepare them, we can first drill two matching holes through both the front and back of each like so. Now we can take just one of them and drill two more holes in the middle, but this time expanding the lower one enough for a screw head to fit into. They can now be bridged with a file, giving us a biting system that will very securely keep the light in place once it's hung onto the wall. Now, as I'd like the back workings of the light to be a piece of art in its own right, I used some metal polish on mine to make them super shiny. After rinsing off any residue, I then gave them a coat of metal lacquer to prevent oxidisation from causing them to look grubby again. They can then be mounted to the back of the wood using some short self-tapping screws. Again, the pilot holes for these must not go through to the front, instead being deep enough only for the screws themselves. Once in place, they are very strong and should prove reliable for wall mounting, on top of being pretty good looking as well. With the back of the light pretty much complete now, it's time to start working on the stuff you'll actually see, and this is where things get particularly interesting. So the first thing to do is drill a small hole in the middle of the wood, but this time actually going through all the way, as wires will later be threaded through it. Below this we can flank it with two larger holes, again going all the way through, that are big enough for a set of long bolts to fit into. As you may have guessed, we're about to start making the floating island that the crystal tower will later sit on. This is going to get quite messy, so to keep the wood clean, we need to take some tin foil and wrap it around the front like so. After breaking through this with a sharp point, the screws can be slid in place, and to make a seal around them we can simply use some blue tack. Now we can take some more tin foil and make it into a mould for the floating island. I'd like mine to be craggy and uneven, so I made sure that the foil was particularly crumpled, which should hopefully have a nice effect. As it's very weak and flimsy though, we need to strengthen it using some gaffer tape. This helps to keep the shape of the foil mould intact, and works surprisingly well. So with that done, we can now mix some cement. The type I'm using just requires water to be added, but other brands may need some sand to be mixed in too, so refer to the instructions on the packaging for guidance. Once you've mixed up a good amount of it, gently add it to the mould, lightly patting it to fill in the various gaps. Once it's dried, it can be pulled out of the bolt holes and then the foil removed from it. As you can see, it looks great, and the texture given to it by the foil really does make it look like a rock. Now, to give it some more depth though, we can take a brush and scuff the ridges of the cement with white paint to make some highlights. We can do a similar thing with the crevice areas, using dark paint this time to give them some emphasis. Once you're done, you should have something that looks like this, which in my opinion looks really cool. Now it can be pushed back into the bolt holes and secured in place using some nuts. Now it's time to add the final two sets of LEDs. These need to be wired up independently so that they have the potential to be different colours, and then soldered to an LED controller each on the back, again making sure that they're connected in the right way. With that done, it should be looking something like this, and it is at last time to add the centrepiece of the entire build, which is of course the crystal tower itself. What I'm using here is a tower of selenite, which is a form of gypsum. As a mineral, it's colourless and slightly transparent, getting its name from the Greek word for moon. I don't know what they were thinking, because everyone knows that the moon is made of cheese, and this clearly is not, but never mind. I have, of course, put some purchasing links to some in the description. Once you have yours, it can simply be glued onto the concrete with some epoxy. 
Mine fits so nicely because I wrapped the tower in a protective layer of cling film and then moulded the concrete around it whilst it was still drying. Whilst the epoxy cures, we can in the meantime work on the power wiring. Now, having a normal black power cable going up to it on the wall would look at best boring and at worst ugly. So let's do something way cooler than that. For this we'll need some enamelled copper wire. I salvaged mine from an old electric motor, but it can also be purchased separately. I'm sure you know by now where to find the links. The enamel on it essentially works like insulation, but you do need to be gentle so as not to rub any of it off, which could cause short circuits. Once you have two lengths, we can double them up so that they can carry the electric current more effectively, after which they can be soldered to a power socket. Now we need some rustic looking jute twine, which can be bundled together as three lengths with a cable tie. After gluing this to the power socket, the jute twine can be plaited together with the enamelled copper, after which a piece of heat shrink tubing can be used to neaten it up and protect it. This gives us a strong and very rustic looking power cord that looks much nicer than your average plastic stuff. One thing to keep in mind is that jute twine is flammable when exposed to a naked flame, but as it's such a low power project that works on a very low voltage and current, involving practically no heat, I'm personally happy with it safety wise for my own use. For peace of mind however, I highly suggest that you soak the twine in flame retardant before plaiting it together. Even though this looks great, it isn't actually going to go straight to the tower and instead will be going to a small block of wood. All will make sense in just a minute. Our special cable can then be attached to some solder tabs which can be screwed to the back like so, with the twine itself being glued to the wood for strength. As this will be leaning on the wall, it needs something to rest on, which in my case is just two PCB pillars that I glued in place. With that done, the final thing to do is get two more lengths of enamelled copper wire, thicker stuff this time though, and use some sandpaper on their ends to strip off some of the enamel. These sections can be made into loops, and then some solder added to bond them together. Now, do you remember those holes we made beneath the power lanes right at the start of this project? Well, we can make use of them now by clamping our enamelled wire loops down onto them using screws. Make note of the polarity though, as the lane with the red wires going to it is positive, and the one with the black wires going to it is negative. Both of these enamelled wires can now be threaded through some holes on the block and looped around to the back, where they too can be clamped underneath the screws there. Don't forget to remove the enamel on these ends too though, so that they make electrical contact. Ok, so by now the epoxy for the selenite tower should have cured, and it's time to mount the whole thing onto the wall. The block too can be held in place directly underneath using a nail, and should provide a bit of tension to the copper wire to keep it straight. This means that our rustic looking power cable goes to the block, which in turn directs the electricity through the enamelled copper wires straight up to the power lanes for the LED controllers. Now before we turn this on for the first time, there is one last step left before it's complete. As you saw in the concept, there was some greenery around the base of the crystal tower, and to recreate this we'll need a selection of dried moss type plants. These can simply be glued in place in a natural looking formation. I had mine bunch over one side a bit and hang off the edge to make it look like some kind of ivy or vines. This final touch adds a lot to the final look, and I hope you agree that it really does look nice. Now it's finally time to try it out. So we can simply plug a 12 volt adapter into the rustic power cord, and all three sets of LEDs should now light up. As we have three LED controllers powering the different LED strips, it allows them to be set to different modes and colours. To do this it's just a case of holding down the various switches on the back, and using the remote control to make the adjustments as desired. Limitless combinations can be selected like this, and it's particularly effective for the crystal tower itself, as having two colours at once takes what would just be flat looking block illumination, and turns it into a much deeper and more visually engaging effect. I personally love how the various ledges catch the light and create more intense glowing patches. Very cool indeed. So as far as DIY lights go, this one's not bad. Not bad at all. 
Right, so that's it for this video. It was a blast to make, so hopefully as a result you enjoyed it. And if you did, don't forget to give it a good thumbs up, because that helps me out a lot. Now, if you'd like to download the concept art that I showed you earlier, you can find links to it in the description if you would like it for maybe your phone background or laptop background. And uh, if you'd like to see how to make these really nice looking mushroom lights, there's a link to that video as well. It's one of the most popular videos on the channel, so if you've not seen it yet, it's definitely worth a watch. Um, now, this was the first DIY project I've done in my new studio. So if you are a regular viewer, um, I hope you appreciated the you know, different look. It was you know, really nice to actually work with things like some greenery, like this little plant. Bought it specially, by the way. Um, and you know, it, I, pff, it looks brilliant. It's like a huge step up this studio. So uh, a huge thanks to those who made it happen. Right, other than that, um, I hope I catch you in my next project. Uh, so bye for now.